Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. A look back at the legislative session tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Antonio Parkinson from the State House. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. London Lamar, also from the State House. Thank you for being for the first time. Thank you. Along with Bill Drees, reporter with The Daily Memphian. Uh, we'll look back at, at the, the, the session as, it, as some of the things that happened, things that people uh, know happened, uh, maybe they missed, and, and what the ramifications and positive and negative and so on of that will be. A couple quick notes. We're taping this um, because of scheduling issues. This is, we taped this a week ago from when it aired. And we did reach out to all the local Republican House members, and none of them were, were able to come on. So I'll, I'll mention that a couple times in the show. Um, for right now, though, as we sit on Friday, um, a week ago from when this airs, uh, the Speaker of the House is under fire uh, for association with some text messages and that were uh, misogynistic and that were involved a whole lot of um, really difficult behavior. <coughs> and your thoughts on that and what whether and he may have resigned the pressure as we sit here taping this the pressure is building on him from republicans and democrats for him to resign but i'll go to you first london your your first reaction when you saw these texts and you saw i think there are images your first reaction uh, i was very shocked you know uh, throughout the session i worked really hard to build a strong relationship with the speaker and had a lot of respect for him even though we disagreed on a lot of policy issues so i was very disappointed to see that were some of the conversations he had not only about th with his staff member but that's how he felt about many tennesseans as a speaker of the house you're obligated to represent all tennesseans no matter if they're a woman or a man or black or white or anything in between. And so we hold our speaker to higher standards and to be the third highest elected official in the state, I think it's appalling that he will think those thoughts about many Tennesseans in this state. As in your interactions with Speaker Casada, did you as a woman or as an African-American, did you ever feel uh, sexism? Did you feel prejudice, any of that? Uh, not in our one-on-one -on -one meetings, no. I felt like he respected me as a legislator, as a colleague, as an equal. Um, we may have differed on policy issues, but we were able to respectfully have conversations about our differences. And so it was very disappointing that behind the scenes, those may be some of the thoughts that he had about myself and others. But, you know, I never felt like he showed those to my face. Um, but obviously those text messages were private conversations. And I think that as a Speaker of the House, even whether you push those thoughts in the public or private, you should not think those about many Tennesseans that you represent. And I assume you believe he should resign? Uh, as of right now, I do believe he should resign. At first, I wanted to give him an opportunity to um, see what action plans he would put out, but I think they're insufficient. And I think that as someone who's the third highest ranking elected official in the state, you should be able to step aside from the speaker position um, and allow someone who can be more inclusive and uh, can represent all people without any prejudiced thoughts. Let me go to you, Antonio, your, your reactions to it. And you've been, uh, London, recently uh, elected. You just finished your first session. You've been in there now, is it eight years? Eight years. Eight right. years. Mm -hmm. So you're, you've interacted, I assume, with, uh, with Speaker Casada when he was, you know, in leadership positions. Mm -hmm. He just ascended into this position. Did you ever experience uh, prejudice or sexism or any of the kinds of things that came out in those text messages? Did you no, ever see no, that? No, absolutely person? not. Uh, uh, I've, I've never experienced any of that with, with um, uh, Speaker Cassidy. Um, you know, you know I, here's the thing for me. Uh, one is uh, we can't get lost on the fact of how this all got started. You know, it all got started because of an email that was sent to the district attorney in Davidson County that had a date change on it that or, or um, possible date change on it and where uh, a young activist that uh, was from Fisk University um, it looks like there was some uh, differences between the emails that that he had versus the email that was sent to the district attorney which would have put him back in jail right and this so this was by uh, the chief of staff by the chief of, of staff yeah. of, 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 of uh, speaker Cassida and and, I, and 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 so you know in all of the things that is happening with the speaker I think that that part of the injustice is being lost and that story is being lost in all of the speakers things which is, is for me as a uh, an African-American um, um, house member 
to see this young man who I know um, being uh, where it appears that he may be being framed uh, possibly or, or, or someone was, was, was making an attempt to have him incarcerated possibly falsely. Um, I think it's important that, that people remember why, why and how we got here. Yeah. Number one. Secondly, uh, in regards to the Speaker Cassida, look, I didn't I didn't elect Speaker Cassida to the Speaker's office, to the Speaker's uh, position. I didn't elect him to the House of Representatives. You know, it was members of his own party that elected him to the Speaker's position. It was members of his own party that elected him as a House member. And it's going to be members of his own party that either removes him from the speaker's office or removes him from office. I can say wh however I want to say, however I feel, but at the end of the day, I didn't vote for him for speaker and then I didn't have enough votes to uh, keep him from being the speaker. So it, it's interesting to me, uh, the, the silence is deafening when it comes to members of his own party who actually elected him into yeah. that position. More, more and more, I mean, to be fair, and, it, and I think, mm. you know, you can go online and kind of see either on our side or other people's sites, some of the people, Republicans who are coming out saying either disapproval or outright he should resign. I think the governor and the lieutenant governor both said, you know, sort of couched their phrases as if he were on my staff, I would want him to resign, that sort of paraphrasing. So just to be fair. Right. And, and again, let me repeat that we asked Republican members of the, the, the Shelby delegation to be here today and they, they, they couldn't. Uh, right. But, and, 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 you know, still, at the end of the day, you had the Speaker of the, of the Senate and you had the governor who said some veiled comments and nothing direct as to what should happen with him. And, 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 but that's only a few out of, what, 66 members or 65 yeah. members that, that could have said something. And let me be clear on this also. When all of the issues of race and misogyny and, and all of those things came forth in these text messages, where were the members of his party that stand on their Christian faith Every time you're in the house, you know, pushing Bible verses and this, that, and other, where were they in defense of some of these allegations of race, some of these allegations of sexism and, 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 and things of that nature? And so, you know, my, my, I, I, I believe that, that it should be pushed back on the people who put him in that office. Procedurally, and then I'll get Bill in here, or maybe Bill, you help me. Mm -hmm. Procedurally, the, the session has ended. So the session, to, for, to vote him out, it would have to, the session, they'd have to call a special session. Is that correct? Am right. I right on that? Right. Okay. Right. And then, so he could resign now. I mean, just, it'd be more symbolically because generally the speaker, the speakership ends technically at the end of the session and he would be most, most likely reelected had this not happened when the session opens again. But in, that's the end of a two year. Right. Is that the, okay, right. the end of the two right. year. So he is still right. speaker. I mean, right. he is still speaker Absolutely. throughout. Okay. Right. And there's a lot of work that's done in the, the sort of the off season, right? When you're not in session, there are meetings and there are things going on. There is, and it, and it would take, uh, uh, a two-thirds um, um, call from the membership to call a special session or the governor can call a special session. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Antonio, to, to your point, if, if this plays out that Speaker Cassidy leaves, uh, how, however, however he leaves, is there a discussion between Democrats and Republicans, a, kind, of a, kind of a reckoning over this that, that goes beyond him then? Yeah. And, and you're talking about in regards of his re to his replacement? No, or I, I, I mean <clears throat> in regards to his comments and what you called the deafening silence. Well, 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 there should be a discussion between Democrats and Republicans right now, Absolutely. Uh, you know, in regards to, to the things that have been said, but there has not been. And, you know, you have a bunch of different silos of people speaking uh, in regards to this, this matter, but you're not hearing it from his party the majority of his party. Now think about it, there have been some that have come out and said something, but those are people that didn't vote for him for speaker anyway. And so, so where are the people that will, that will stand up and um, uh, grow a set and, and, and speak out for what's right? And I think for me, what's most appalling <coughs> is the fact that those who have spoken now have been, in the, uh, they've spoken now after the allegation of sexual misconduct have come out. But when we were talking about the racial issues, about them using the N word, about them framing a black activist, there was silence. And so I've started my term being able to call out some of the issues of racism among my colleagues, because we know that is a problem. And their silence among, about the issues of racism that our speaker talked about, to me, is, is confirms some of the thoughts of some of my colleagues. They do agree with some of the things that he he's said. And sometimes when you are silent, that means 
means you agree with what he's doing as well. If we want to be bold in our approach, if we truly want to represent all Tennesseans, then we need to speak out on the first instance of injustice. And when we talk about racism, when we talk about um, calling black people idiots, many of us are your colleagues who are African American. And I think that we're all smart and intellectual. And let me let me reframe the question I asked before to a broader, you know, there are a lot of divides in the legislature, you know, re Republican and Democrat, rural and urban, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and the, <clears throat> and so on. Have you felt, and you've been there longer, I mean, from anyone, do you, do you feel racism or do you feel prejudice from your colleagues up there um, explicitly or implicitly? Let, 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 me, so, let, me, let me be clear, and, and, and I've, I've, I've been on record on the House floor of talking about policy that was racist. And when they were taking the money uh, from Memphis because of the removal of the Confederate statues, I got booed on the House floor because of that. But let, let, let me say this though, and I don't want this to be lost on what my uh, young colleague said just a second ago. When she made her comments on, on live, they raked her across the coals about what she was saying. Now you have, you know, these, these, these words that, 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 that are in text from the, the um, um, his chief of staff and no one from that party that raked her across the coals are saying let me, anything let me about refer, it. Have you, I don't know why I'm focused on this, but I mm -hmm. just want to for a second. The, have you felt that not, not so much on the policy and interpreting a policy as race, and that we can debate mm -hmm. and discuss, but I mean, just have you felt that personally, in personal interaction? So, so, uh, you know for me? Oh, yeah, 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 I, I do. Or, or, I, 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 yeah, I, and I'm willing, go ahead. You want, I'll defer no, to the no, young no, lady no, and I'll I come mean, back behind her. Yes, you know, I have, I, you know, I feel, you know, you can feel when someone doesn't respect the comments that you have, um, you know, are uh, disrespectful in their responses to your questions, um, laugh at you when you are bringing up points about how particular policy affects your my community, which is predominantly African American, which I have an obligation to speak up for and stand up for. So yes, it's there. You can feel it. You can feel it when you walk down the hallways. Now they may not call me out my name to my face because, right. you know, that's not something I'm sure will be allowed. But at the end of the day, you know it's there. And whether it's inadvertently or, you know, out in the open, uh, it's something that's real. There's also, and I will say this just more from the perspective of being up over the last 10 or 15 years at the at the Capitol for all, any kind of news reasons and also, you know, press association reasons, there's a tremendous antipathy towards Memphis. Absolutely. You know, so I walk up there as a 50-year-old white guy and I look like, you know, a lot of these rural legislators mm -hmm. and I'll say I'm from Memphis and they'll say I'm sorry. And right. this happens again, and this is a story that people mm -hmm. who don't know the legislature know that that dynamic is is this very it's it's less than it used to be, believe it or not, I think. No. But it's it's very real that there is mm -hmm. this antipathy towards Memphis among legislators Absolutely. up there that I, is that is transcends race and 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 gender. And I'm not taking away from what you said, Absolutely. but it's an interesting dynamic. And, and and it has not. It's still the same. It's still the same. Just the same as it was yeah. uh, before. Um, you know, um, to and you obviously are there much, much more than me. So right, I right, you. right. And, 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 you know, the, the, the amount of disrespect towards the city that contributes probably the majority of the resources to the state coffers Absolutely. Is, is, is to me, um, is, is unacceptable. And, 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 you know, and, 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 you know, last year, I, I or a year before, I, I joked with the idea of secession from Davidson County to the Mississippi River. But, you know, you think about it, and I just wanted people to think about that. You know, you have the two biggest uh, contributors to the state coffers, and both of them are disrespected. Memphis more than Davidson, right? But, but, but people it, from Nashville say the same thing. Right, yeah, right, right. But if, but if you took those away, this would probably be the poorest state in the union. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so th that matters. Uh, mm -hmm. Halfway through the show, mm -hmm. and let me also again reiterate for people coming late, we, we did ask Republicans, local House Republican members to be here, and um, uh, we were not able to get any on bill. So uh, uh, among the other uh, fireworks late in the session was, was something that happened on the last day, and that was Democrats were leaving the chamber, and there was an attempt to, to stop Democrats from leaving the chamber. Um, my question is, what does this bode for, for, for the future? Is, is it possible that given the emotion that's there right now that could be there at the start, the reaction to proposals going through a majority Republican legislature, are walkouts a possibility in your chamber? Well, see, so, so that, you have to frame that in the moment that it happened. Mm -hmm. In the moment, there's a couple of different dynamics happening. One, we were actually in a recess. 
And so anybody can walk out in a recess. But now let's go back just a few, a little bit more in time before that. A lot of the Republican members had gone home because they weren't staying for the last day of session. So we're in a recess. A lot of their members have gone, right? And, and we decide because they were silencing um, uh, Democrats in regards to health care, that we're going to go and huddle together and, um, and talk about it in the recess. Well, when we decided to go and huddle about it, I, I, I think the speaker saw that, you know, he might possibly not have a quorum to finish the business. And so that's when the call was made to lock the doors, secure the doors, and, and, and keep everyone on the inside. But at, by that time, you got bodies in between the double doors, legs sticking out on one end, I think troopers pushing, out, pushing in on the outside, and... And, and Democrats pushing out and security trying to hold Democrats in and, you know, bodies start rolling up the aisle, you know. So, so that's kind of what, 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 what happened there. You know, what, whether or not, uh, you, know, you know, we fight. That's what we do. In mm -hmm. the House, we fight. Senate is a little bit different, you know. It's not as, not as lively <laughs> as, as the dysfunctional House is. And, 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 and it's in and, and some aspect of family, a dysfunctional one at that. But, but well, we a fight. Larger, a larger family at 99 members and 99, 99 boisterous members. <laughs> right, right. Energetic members. Who are all elected. Who are all elected mm -hmm. and may have had some coffee and, you know, and, and, and they're raring to go. <laughs> and so, you know, so so the house, you know, you got to love the house. It's, 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 it's a very interesting dynamic. So so it was kind of a convergence of factors that that, that no one planned. But mm -hmm. but does it raise the possibility of using a walkout as a tool, given that whoever is the speaker needs three Democrats in order to maintain a quorum? No. Then, then let me tell you why. OK, because because you it takes 50 votes to pass something on the House floor. Okay, if you remove 34 of us, if you remove our, our what, what are we, 20, 26, 26. 26, 26 of us, right. they still have enough to pass right. anything they want to pass. And so, and that's one of the things that, that uh, you know, uh, is lost on me. You know, you, you have the numbers to do what you want to do. So you can be the hero at every turn, honestly, uh, if you're in the majority, because you have the numbers to do, do, do if, we, if we didn't, if we didn't have Republican allies in some issues, on some issues, they could just run roughshod over the whole session. And where, where are those? Where, where, uh, looking back, I mean, I'll try to be more positive for a minute. I mean, where, where, you had to have worked with some Republicans, some local or in other states. What are some examples? I mean, it's not all this hostility. We, we, because of what happened mm -hmm. with Speaker Casada and some of these other things, that's where we started today. I think but there are other points at which things did get done. I mean, mm -hmm. we have items, you know, $10 million for the riverfront. There were right. some things that got Absolutely. done that took and I imagine involve some back and forth and cooperation. Absolutely, I think a great example is of that is even though it passed the voucher vote, there were both Democrats and Republicans who were opposing this particular piece of legislation. And matter of fact, before the speaker flexed his power and held the vote, the, the, the vote was failing. It was, it, it, the more Republicans helped us defeat this bill until there were some conversations to swing another Republican over. But even on simple education bills about, you know, protecting our public schools, you see Republicans and Democrats on the same page working together. There was a bill about, you know, recalling school board members mm -hmm. where both Republicans and Democrats had concerns about what precedents we would set if we were able to um, recall school board members with, for any reason. And there are a number of bills and legislation we can point to to show that we're working together. And quite honestly, the majority of legislation, both Democrats and Republicans vote together on all the time. Yeah. And so a lot of times what you see on TV is the bills where we're fighting against each other, when we're yeah. on opposite sides, where we're going at each other's heads. But the majority of the time you see it's, it's a consensus green light on the board. And, and, you know, despite, you know, our difficulties and our difference of opinions, and we always keep the fact that we're working for all people at the forefront of how we vote in our legislation, then I think that we have more uh, alikes than differences. Bill. As we're recording this, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation has, has acknowledged that it is investigating some of the uh, trades that were being made for votes on the school voucher bill. Absolutely. Uh, the, the deciding vote, as it, as it turns out, um, voted for it after, and he was very open about this, after 
uh, Knoxville, the, the, the area that he represents, came out of the voucher bill. Um, is that kind of deal making, it, 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 should that be the object of a criminal investigation? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead, go ahead and now I'm passing okay, on to okay. you. First of all, absolutely, I think that to hold the vote for 40 minutes and then be calling people, and some of these folks you heard him calling up to the well on the mic, or taking them out to the balcony and having conversations about changing their votes. We obviously know if someone was very firm on a no, and then you have a conversation with them, and they turn to yes, there's some um, discrepancies there that we need to think uh, to talk about. Um, for us, it is very out in the open and abuse of power. Um, and if, you know, citizens are explaining that they don't want something and you're <clears throat> pushing a threat in chairmanships or whatever that may be in order to change their vote, that's unacceptable. And it's also offensive, especially when it comes to this voucher vote, to say that, well, if it's not good for my county, then, you know, it's okay that we put it on Shelby County and Davidson County, even though you're saying we don't want it in ours, but then their key is needed. And that's problematic to me because as legislators, even though we represent our own districts, we have an obligation to think about all Tennesseans because the legislation that we pass typically affects all Tennesseans. So to hear our legislators say, well, I'm only going to pass this bill because it's going to mess up Shelby County or Davidson County schools, to me is problematic. And so for the speaker to push that and his Republican colleagues to push that, for the governor to push that, it to me is offensive. And I think what it does is open the doors to tell you that some things are going on that's not right, that deals are being made, and that if you're going to vote for something just because it affects one particular population of kids and not yours, that in itself is criminal. Well, I, I don't, I don't know about criminal, uh, you know, but the, so if if something if something was given um, um, in exchange, something probably tangible was given in exchange for uh, a vote change that that or, or a vote that 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 could be the criminal part of it. Now, if, if you're adjusting legislation to accommodate. Uh, a member or some members, that's just like making an amendment to the bill. So that's normal. That's normal practice. But here's the thing. You know, I, you know, my colleague, uh, Representative Zachary, said that... They, He's the that, uh, representative from Knoxville who's, right, who switched right. the vote. Who switched the vote. He said that they took Knoxville out of it, so that's what it gave him the um, uh, go-ahead to, to cast the vote. Well, here's the, here's the, the problem with that, that statement. If he'd have voted no, Knoxville wouldn't have been in the bill. Mm -hmm. And so the bill would have died. So Knoxville or no one, anyone else wouldn't have been in the bill. So I don't really subscribe to his reasoning for casting casting their vote. And, and, and lastly, let me let me make this point too. And 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 the the reports that I've heard is not TBI that's investigating this. FBI, the feds that are investigating this deal. So you know either one, you know I. Either one is bad to me, and I wouldn't wish that on any of my colleagues to be under investigation by either TBI or FBI. And this goes back to, I mean, we were talking before mm -hmm. about the, the various divisions, and, you know, it's on, really only Davidson County and, and Shelby County that are subject to the, to, uh, if we didn't make that clear. Mm -hmm. uh, with just a couple minutes left, let me walk through a couple of just real nitty bills that got through, that got a lot of attention. We talked about the vouchers and where that's going, online gambling, um, that passed that so now there'll be sports betting allowed on phones and computers and so on within Tennessee. I think both of y'all were in favor of that. Right. What, yes. what do you want to see come from that? And do you want that to be the first step towards full-blown legalized gambling in Shelby County? Um, I voted for in support because I think with heavy regu regulation, it's happening anyway. And I would rather Tennessee be able to use some of those dollars that come from gambling to support uh, education and other initiatives that help our community. Um, you know, you see a lot of, of our citizens aren't engaged in gambling. They're either taking their dollars across the bridge to Arkansas or down the road mm -hmm. to Tunica, Mississippi. And I would rather our dollars stay in our state. And so that was why I supported the bill. Will you support further expansion? I mean, brick and mortar, they say, you know, casinos in Tennessee, Shelby County, would you support that sort of I, bill? I'm open to it. Open I'm to open it. to it. With just a couple minutes left, another bill that passed was expungements. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the $180 expungement right. fee was removed. Uh, right. It's a criminal justice issue that actually, I think more and more Democrats and Republicans are coming together on some right. of those issues. Talk about that expungement. Well, well, well you know, so, so just real, real quick, I know we're short on time. First of all, you know, the, the, our Republican colleagues had gotten the marching instructions from some of their um, uh, 
people who give them marching instructions, some of the organizations, um, to, to incarcerate everybody. And so mass incarceration was, was going on, and now it's busted the coffers of, of the budgets. So now they've, they've changed face and say, hey, we shouldn't be incarcerating everyone. So let's find a way to keep people and out of the And some would prison. say, to be fair, because we don't have right, right. some Many would say it's not a, just the budget. It's also a realization that it's wrong. And it's, a lot of people goes back to their Christian faith and, and forgigiveness and so on. So right. just to well, push back a little bit on Just to push back on you a little bit. It's not just about money. Just to push back on you a little bit. They were right. Christians before that. <laughs> right. And, 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 so, and, so, and, and it didn't become a conversation. Honestly, in, in my eight years, I've been fighting for criminal justice reform since day one. In my eight years, it did not become a conversation until it became a budgetary issue. And, and it's unfortunate, but, but we're looking at it in a humanitarian, from a humanitarian standpoint. They're looking at it from a fiscal standpoint. Mm -hmm. I don't care what their reason for looking, looking at it is. Let's get it done. We got this $180 off of there, but there's still fees there's locally you know, that, okay. that people have to do. So. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, right. Bill. And thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.